Welcome to those who have found us on the internet or are listening to the podcast. Uh, this is the first Sunday of August 2014. It's Eastminster United Church in Belleville, Ontario, and we are continuing some reflections on the Lord's Prayer. Very familiar words, but sometimes the familiarity gets in the way of claiming the full import of the meaning. And this morning we have also heard another bit of scripture that gave us this to chew on. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Let's pray. Bless us, O God, with such a sense of your presence now that whatever words are spoken by your spirit, somehow the word we hear will be whatever you want us to hear today, whatever we need to hear today. Amen. Did you know that there is a, a National Eating Disorder Awareness Week? For seven days in February, media dis distribute statistics, personal stories, and scientific explanations about the incredibly high incidence of sometimes fatal eating disorders like anorexia, nervosa, and bulimia. I've read that as many as six out of 100 teenage girls in this country suffer from one of these extraordinary conditions. For these young women and many others, the prayer for daily bread can be a matter of life and death desperation. I had my first encounter with anorexia almost 40 years ago. A 15-year-old girl in one of our congregations just stopped eating. She was eventually hospitalized, almost died several times as the lack of food caused her organs to shut down, first her kidneys, then others. Her illness was as perplexing as it was frightening because she was the typical anorexic. She was the oldest child in what seemed to be a wonderfully normal home. Her parents enjoyed a good marriage. Her, her whole family was, was well-adjusted, and, and this was the first real crisis that any of them had ever had to face. The girl was attractive. She was a good student, consistently high marks. She was a successful athlete. She was so popular with her peers that she'd been elected to the school student council. She was the perfect daughter living the perfect life, until she stopped eating and almost died. Medical authorities suggest various uh, explanations for these eating disorders, including low self-esteem, the possibility of sexual abuse, and the unattainable ideal of beauty as defined by undernourished models. Still, there is no agreement about the causes and traditional forms of treatment are not reliably successful. Some treatments which have been successful are based on the assumption that such disorders begin deep within the personality where, for reasons unknown, the individual is persuaded that she is not worthy of love. The problem is not the lack of loving, but the perverse inability to accept the loving. For some, this deeply rooted unconscious refusal to be loved produces a distorted self-perfection which looks in the mirror and sees only ugliness. As our study of the Lord's Prayer brings us to the request for daily bread, consider this. While we live in a society where resources and merchandise are consumed with the appetite of insatiable gluttony, there is an epidemic of what could be called spiritual eating disorders either the anorexia that has no concern for spirituality at all, or the bulimia of binge fanaticism followed by purges of emotional disappointment. Jesus told us to pray for our daily bread because he knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows for how many of us the prayer for daily bread is a matter of life and death desperation. Whether we are physically or spiritually hungry, or if we are overstuffed, Let's think about what it means for us to pray for our daily bread. Jesus said, when you pray, say this, give us. Despite the nobility of our prayerful intentions and the high-sounding form formality of the words, Jesus actually told us to sound like children when we pray. Turn to God, Jesus said, 
and say, gimme. The master instructs us to open our hearts to God in such a way that we reveal our innermost wants, needs, and desires. Like petulant children standing before a long-suffering parent, Jesus tells us to pray like this, God, I want you to give me what I want. Think about what's happening when we ask God to give us. There is, first of all, a recognition of need. When the luxury passenger liner, the Queen Mary, was built, her owners assumed that with her enormous size and state-of-the-art engineering, she would be so stable that there was no need in that ship for handrails. When she was launched, the Queen Mary sailed without handrails in her hulls and stairways. And it was a disaster. In her first storm, the ship pitched so badly in the rough seas that several passengers were injured, a few even killed as they were thrown down the stairs. After only a few weeks, the Queen Mary returned to the shipyards to be fitted with more than 30 kilometers of hand railing. In their arrogance, the owners and engineers assumed that there was no need. There's something about our makeup, we human beings, that makes us vulnerable to dangerous assumptions of self-sufficiency. The more we're able to solve our problems, the more confident we are that we can handle anything. The more trials we survive, the more easily we assume a false sense of security. We're like the chicken who runs out to meet the farmer every morning. And since the farmer always brings food, the chicken is convinced that the purpose of the farmer is to feed the chickens. The chicken becomes more and more confident, fearlessly taking for granted the benign intentions of the farmer until the morning when the hungry farmer shows up with an ax. Jesus understood the danger of taking things for granted. So he told us to get down on our knees before God and like children admit the needs which we ourselves cannot provide. When we say give us, we're not only recognizing our needs, we are acknowledging the giver. In an episode of the television series, The Simpsons, the irrepressible Bart is asked to say grace. He says, since we paid for all this stuff ourselves, thanks for nothing. <laughs> Obviously, Bart does not understand the meaning of the Lord's Prayer. When we ask God to give, we are reminding ourselves that there is a God who is both willing and able to provide. No matter how hard the circumstances of your life may, and how extraordinary the needs, no matter how loud may be the voices which testify to the absence of God, no matter how helpless you feel or alone you may be, if you believe what you're saying when you speak the Lord's Prayer, then you know that there is a God who is listening and caring and willing to give. If he knew the Lord's Prayer, what it teaches us about God, Bart Simpson's grace might sound more like this. Since I know the vastness of my need and the limits of my own ability, thank you, God, for everything. Jesus said, pray, give us this day. Jesus taught us to pray with a sense of anticipation and an expectation of immediacy. It reminds me of the story of Lazarus, and you know it well. When Jesus stood at the grave of the dead man's grieving sister, Martha, he told her that Lazarus will live again. And Martha dismissed his words as kind, but not particularly helpful. Oh, she said, oh, yeah, I know, I know, I know, yeah, he will rise again in the last day. In other words, she assented to some future blessing that had very little to do with the pain that she was suffering there and then. But Jesus refused to be put off. He said, no, no, no. He said, I am the resurrection here and now. And I am the life, not someday, but this day. And then he ordered the grave to be opened so that Lazarus could live again immediately. When we say this day, we admit the practical timeliness of our needs, while at the same time we affirm the providential timeliness of God's helping presence in our lives. The Reverend Jim Eschenbrenner tells the story of a farmer who one year was especially proud of his corn. 
In the spring he had carefully prepared the ground so that the soil was as close to perfect as he could make it. He did everything that he could to make it just right. And then he went out when the corn was as high as an elephant's eye and the picture of perfection. He went out with his John Deere combine. Beautiful day, everything running smoothly until he realized that something was missing. He couldn't hear the noise of the corn kernels filling the combine hopper. He stopped the equipment, climbed out of the cab, up the ladder to find to his utter amazement that the hopper was empty. When he checked the corn, he found stock after stock, which had grown large, looked perfectly formed, but there were no kernels of corn. And when he told his friends that story in church the next Sunday, he said, I did everything I could, and the field looked perfect. But, he said, the harvest is in God's hands. Everything is in God's hands. There isn't a day goes by when we do not need the help of God. There isn't a moment when we are detached from the umbilical cord which by grace connects us with God. That's why Jesus taught us when we pray to say this day. To pray this day for the help of God, the healing of God, the guidance of God, the forgiveness of God, the consolation of God. Pray for what God alone can give this day and every day that we live. Even when things are going so well that we feel on top of the world, this is still the day when we need to pray. Give us this day our those of us who have any conscience at all should feel downright embarrassed when we pray for God to give us what we ask. Who do we think we are? What makes us think that we deserve anything, certainly anything else from God? Spiritually speaking, our credit ranking would make us make any collection agency drool. And yet, when Jesus taught us to pray, he told us to boldly ask for what is ours. According to the Master, we should pray with an expectation of entitlement. And this is a fundamental biblical principle that God gives according to entitlement rather than deserving. This principle has shaped the social policies of Canadian democracy for generations so that people receive the services of government not because they qualify but because they are entitled by virtue of our citizenship. Therefore there is no shame in receiving a pension check when you retire or employment insurance if you lose your job or social assistance when you're desperate or health care when you need it. As the vagaries of politics and shifting sands of public policy threaten universal health care, public education, and the social safety net, remember this. So long as we pray for our daily bread, we will affirm as ordained by God that principle of entitlement which is called grace. Give us this day our daily there are among our neighbors those who like to accuse us of what they call hypocrisy. The allegation that the convictions we profess on Sunday do not always govern what we do the rest of the week. And few of us are not at least sometimes guilty as charged. There are times when our relationships, maybe with cranky neighbors or troublemakers at work, do not reflect the gospel teachings about love. There are times when we make decisions without giving sufficient weight to the will of God. There are even times when we struggle to solve the problem or carry the burden or find our way as if God has left us alone. The problem, you know, it isn't hypocrisy, it's forgetfulness. That's why Jesus taught us when we pray to say daily. Every day we need to pray to God who is with us every day for the help we need every day for the problems we face every day. Peter Marshall, a well-known preacher, he was the chaplain of the American Senate and, and his uh, writings continue to have tremendous impact. He once offered this commentary on our need for daily spirituality. He said, if God does not enter your kitchen, there's something wrong with your kitchen. If you can't take God into your recreation, there's something wrong with your play. We all believe in the God of the heroic, he said. 
What we need most these days is the God of the humdrum, the commonplace, the everyday. The most successful treatments for anorexia nervosa are based in the assumption that the eating disorder originates in a deep, deeply subconscious inability to accept love. Typically, young anorexics and bulimics grow up in middle-class, well-adjusted families where there is no doubt that they are loved, but somehow they lose the ability to believe it. Lest we forget how much we are loved, we need to say the Lord's Prayer as often as we can and pray it daily to reinforce in our subconscious the conviction that God loves us enough to be with us in the ordinary, the humdrum, the commonplace. We are so loved that God cares about what's happening in our lives every day, daily. Give us this day our daily bread. The significance of bread, I think, is easily lost in the context of fast food restaurants, microwave ovens, and eat-on-the-fly lifestyles. Betty and I learned how complex is our need for daily bread from a friend of ours named Judy. I've, I've mentioned her before. As a young mom in her 20s, Judy developed a condition, a condition which forced the removal of almost all of her gastrointestinal system, including her stomach and large bowel. In order to survive, Judy was one of the first people in Canada to receive a treatment called Total Parental Nutrition, TPN, or Heart Feeding. A shunt was permanently placed in a vein near the heart so that a liquid food could enter her system intravenously. For the last 25 years of her life, Judy was not able to take any food by mouth. She lived on the bags of food which entered her body every night while she slept in a chair. The most remarkable thing about Judy was her extraordinary ability to live, laugh, and love in circumstances that, that, that should have broken the spirit of a saint. The remarkable thing about her feeding was how difficult it was to provide the right mix of necessary nutrients, vitamins, and minerals to keep her alive. And at the time when she started, the only company in the world that produced the food was in Sweden and its ingredients had to be continually adjusted according to Judy's needs. If the balance of nutrients was wrong, she became weak or developed seizures or her hair fell out or any number of other things. Most of us who eat without thinking never know how complex is our need for daily bread. But God knows. God knows our need to be properly fed Every day. That's why the Israelites starving in the desert were given manna, a bread that lay on the, like dew on the ground. And God knows we cannot live by bread alone, that we need more than manna, that even if our bodies thrive, our spirits can starve. And that's why Jesus said, I am the bread, the bread of life. And if you eat this bread, you will never be hungry. Judy would have died without the food that flowed through the tube into her body every night. And it makes you wonder, how many of us are dying, spiritually at least, spiritually wasting away because, well, because we refuse to eat that bread of life. Whatever the cause, whether it is an anorexia that refuses to receive, or a bulimia that binges on popular spirituality but refuses to truly believe, God help us to mean it when we pray, give us this day our daily bread. Amen.